The Premier has now joined us. Go ahead, Premier. Thank you, Chris. Before I open up to any questions, I just want to make a, a few comments about uh, Minister McClellan. Um, uh, I'm happy for uh, Minister McClellan and George and Daniel, uh, who are his children and he's going to get to spend more time with. I'm actually sad for Nova Scotians. Uh, Jeff is exactly what you see, a genuine, hard-working, caring, loving guy who always tries to do what he believes is in the best interest uh, of the entire province. Uh, he is a proud boy from the Bay. Uh, I can tell you my first phone call with him, looking for him to be a candidate in the by-election that took place, and many of you who followed my career would know that was not at a highlight. <laughs> that was not at a high point, I should say. Uh, and Jeff joined me at a time, uh, quite frankly, where my own leadership was being reviewed by the party, and he never has never wavered in his uh, support for me, uh, for the decisions that we've made as a government. Uh, I love the guy. He is, uh, uh, I've, I've t I tell him this, uh, I, I love him for who he is. Uh, uh, he is a big part of my extended family. Uh, we will uh, be friends. Uh, lots of people say that when they leave places. We will be friends and stay connected. Uh, I think so highly of him uh, and the work he's done. I have so many stories uh, that I could tell, uh, but I do want to share with you a story that I think tells you a little bit about uh, the man. And it was in our first by-election, uh, and I went down campaigning with Jeff. Um, I used to tease Jeff about knocking on doors. Uh, that was not his favorite thing, and he didn't do it that often. Uh, but uh, he had such a rapport with, uh, with the people of Glace Bay because it was in his blood. But his first campaign that we went, uh, they did uh, uh, a radio station, uh, did hits from his headquarters throughout the day. I did a few of them, Jeff did a few of them. But his father did one, uh, Dan. Uh, and I remember uh, Jeff was a little worried about uh, his father coming in. His father was a bit older at the time, uh, and he just wanted, didn't want him to feel the pressure of having uh, to uh, go on the radio and fill in that one minute. Uh, it wasn't that hard for his son and I to do that, but he was, he was a little worried about doing that uh, to his father. Uh, but his father uh, uh, accepted the challenge and hit it out of the ballpark. Uh, he was so outstanding. Uh, and I know how I watched Jeff's face uh, glow uh, as his father was expressing uh, the things about the Bay uh, and about Jeff uh, and uh, I, I just got a chance, quite frankly, to see uh, what stirs inside of him. And I've seen that same expression when he looks at George and Daniel out of him, with so much pride uh, in them and in his family and in that community. And when Jeff got elected, um, he showed up at the office, went to the office, and I went down to see him, and his father's lunch kettle uh, was in his office. Uh, he has never forgotten. He has never forgotten who he is. Uh, and uh, I, I, am, uh, I am happy for him, as I said earlier, uh, but I am really sad for Nova Scotians. Um, uh, someone asked him earlier about uh, replacing me. There were many, 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 many Nova Scotians who I'm sure put a lot of pressure on him to enter the race. Uh, uh, but he stayed committed to what he really wanted to do, which was spend some time with his two young kids. Uh, and he is one of those people who can't find balance. It is, you're all in. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to getting a chance to go to the Bay this summer, hopefully, uh, and spend some time with him and his kids. Uh, and my hope is they'll show up in Upper Granville um, and uh, uh, we'll get to do a few things together. Be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Premier. We'll do one question and one follow up in the amount of time that we have for today. First question will go to Global's Elizabeth McSheffrey. Hi, Premier. Um, of course, this is the last time we'll have you in cabinet, so, so congratulations and we'll miss you. Uh, it seems like in the last two weeks there have been more funding and policy announcements than we can keep up with as reporters. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, why that's all coming down the pipe now, whether there's a bit of sense of, you know, cramming in some of the bucket list items before you go. Uh, and while you're on that topic, can you just tell us a little bit about what these last two weeks have been like for you as Premier? 
Uh, to be perfectly honest, over the last two weeks, I haven't noticed much of a change. Uh, we've continued to, to govern. I've said that I would govern up until my last day. Uh, that will include uh, through the transition. Uh, even though the new leader is being chosen on Saturday, uh, I'll have to wait till they're sworn in. I will continue to govern. The announcements that we're making uh, have been in the works for quite some time. They've just been finalized uh, during this period of time. Elizabeth, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, I'd just like to ask about the this morning's announcement in the Life Partners uh, for Long-Term Care Act. Just wondering how this is going to affect the admission process for LTCs, whether they'll need to make any adjustments in how they process applications, um, and whether it means uh, some people who are hoping to get into homes might need to move into homes that are further away to accommodate some of the couples? No, well, no. Uh, what you're looking at. So, first of all, this piece of le this this legislation was passed uh, a while ago. Uh, what we announced this week, we were able to finalize the regulations around it, so it'll take effect uh, the first of the next month. Uh, and what it is really, we all have, we've seen stories really long before I, I came into government uh, where you would have uh, a husband and wife uh, partners who uh, maybe need different levels of care, but they needed care. So one would be in a uh, level one or a level two facility, and we would separate them. No one would ever assess them based on the fact that they should be together as a couple. Uh, and this piece of legislation will allow uh, that if someone is, you, you have to require care, uh, and whether you are at a different level than your spouse, you will both be able to share uh, the same facility. So, uh, you know, th it doesn't mean that if you're a healthy spouse and you're living at home and you live at home, you, th they'll stay there. It just requires that if you both need care, uh, whether it's, you'll be able to get that care at the same level and not be separated. Next question will go to Keith Doucette with the Canadian Press. Good afternoon, Premier. Um, as you know, the, uh, the ferry is going to be tied up for a third consecutive year. Uh, I'm wondering, given that fact, whether you still believe the ferry is value for money. Can you tell that to Nova Scotians in all honesty? 100%. All right. Can you, can you explain why you feel that way? Uh, we, we, uh, obviously, a lot of people are, are, are wondering uh, whether uh, millions of dollars should go to this service that basically hasn't sailed in three years. Well, there's no question. This is this is uh, our international connection. Uh, I, I fully uh, commit it to, uh, to this service. Uh, I hope uh, future governments will be as well. Uh, this has been one uh, that I believe the decision to sever that tie that was made by a previous government was wrong. Uh, and uh, that we've continued to try to make that connection. It's been, uh, there's no question, uh, I wish we could have done it for less money. Uh, I believe uh, it, it is sustainable. Uh, in the long run, uh, there will be a, uh, a subsidy of some sort. I don't believe it has to be as high as it is right now, uh, but we need to have uh, some confidence out there in the tourism sector and the business sector that that'll be there uh, for the long haul uh, and that uh, once we, I believe, once we get a, a number of seasons uh, where that vessel is sailing in a row, uh, we will see that uh, provincial subsidy come down. Next question will go to CTV's Natasha Pace. Thank you. Um, Premier, I'm just wondering, uh, for the last nearly 11 months, you've been providing regular updates about the pandemic, sometimes multiple times a week. Um, what kind of work is being done to, I guess, transition whoever the new Premier will be into this uh, difficult file? Yeah, so uh, as part of the entire, uh, you know, they're working, each each team would be working on a transition plan with inside of government. I'll support them with that as well as my chief of staff. But we've also in ensured that uh, public health is in the process now, that they will do a transition with uh, who's ever chosen this coming week uh, to give them an update in the structure. And, and of course, we'll walk th with them through this and how uh, and the process that we've used uh, working side by side with public health to deal with COVID. Go ahead with your follow-up, Natasha. Thank you. Um, also wondering um, the fact that there will be a new leader ch chosen on Saturday. H how are you feeling um, today with how you're leading the province in terms of, of COVID? We're the envy of many other provinces across the country right now. Uh, listen, I'm proud of my record uh, as uh, the Premier of this province, not just in the last uh, year. 
uh, over the last seven years. Uh, I believe this province is in a position to, to weather COVID better than any other place, not just because we've been able to manage uh, and work with public health uh, and, and Nova Scotians, quite frankly, to support and keep uh, the cases down, but because of uh, our, our fiscal uh, capacity now and our, and, and our ability to be able to grow from here. Uh, is uh, this is a, uh, a real opportunity for us as a, as a province to come out of this much better, as I said, than uh, most uh, provinces in this country. Uh, I'm proud of Nova Scotians who have worked so hard uh, to uh, uh, work with each other and keep each other safe. This has been one of those years of like it, n none other, uh, not just because of COVID, uh, but I have been so inspired by the way Nova Scotians have wrapped their arms around each other uh, and supported each other and kept our and, and, and followed the advice of public health uh, even when uh, it was fiscally to their detriment. Uh, they followed the advice of public health to keep everyone safe. Uh, we're reaping the benefits of that now. I, I want to make sure though that everyone who is listening realizes we're not through this pandemic yet. We need to continue to follow the public health. Let's make sure that the work of the last 11 months uh, is, is not, is, it doesn't get wasted by taking a chance. We've seen very quickly this virus can take off on us. We're seeing it next door. Uh, we're watching what's happened in other parts of Canada. Uh, so I'm proud of where we are right now, I'm proud of uh, Nova Scotians for that. And I believe uh, we can continue uh, to keep ourselves uh, the envy of North America and beyond, quite frankly, uh, uh, as we roll out this vaccine. Next question will go to Mike Gorman with CBC. Thank you. Uh, Premier, I'm hoping to get just a little bit of clarification on the province's stance with respect to temporary foreign workers coming here. Yesterday you had said it's, it's your hope or it's your belief, I guess, that as these planes arrive that the folks on them should do their quarantine close to the airport where they land. And so, so obviously that does not mean Halifax. Folks in the agricultural industry say that they were under the impression that the approach used last year where people could land in Canada, then fly directly to Nova Scotia to then start their quarantine would be the process used. So I'm just hoping you could clarify um, for folks in the agricultural industry what currently is the expectation when it comes to the import of temporary foreign workers. Thanks very much, uh, Mike, for that question. Uh, right now, an international traveler has to land, when they land in Canada, has to stay near the airport they're landing in. That's not, a, that's not something Nova Scotians, Nova Scotia government has done, it's the national government has put in place. So if you are an international traveler and you land in Toronto, Montreal, Calgary or Vancouver, you need to stay in one of those quarantine hotels because when you land you're being tested. So that test they think will take about three days uh, and during that period of time you're quarantining at the hotel or near a hotel uh, of one of those four airports. If that test comes back uh, negative, uh, then you're able to fly on to the destination uh, that you're heading to. So if those that are flying to Nova Scotia would be able to leave after they get a positive test, and then they would have to finish their quarantining here uh, as they did last spring, except they, last spring they did all 14 days here. In this case, they'll have to do a number when they land at an airport uh, in, in uh, wherever they land in Canada, and then they can finish it here if they end up with a negative test. If they get a positive test, they have to stay where they are. Go ahead with your follow-up, Mike. Great, thanks for that. Um, Premier, just on a, on a different note, you were asked a few minutes ago about the ferry, and you had mentioned that you wish the subsidy could be less, and obviously you can't control uh, what's been going on with COVID, but is it your view that there's any room within the existing contract with Bay Ferries for there to be some sort of renegotiation of the terms, or do you think it's going to fall to whomever is government at the um, end of that contract in 2025 to revisit those terms? Uh, it'll be obviously that that contract uh, that that subsidy will come down uh, through the life of this contract. Uh, there's there are provisions built that are based on revenue. Uh, we've obviously had some real challenging things happening in in the last uh, uh, number of years. But um, yeah, so the, the, and then whoever will come 2025 will negotiate whatever contract they they see fit at the time. Uh, with Bay Ferries or someone else is going to operate it. But uh, part of the contract cost right now is, you know, there's some really baked in costs associated with securing a vessel, all of those types of things uh, that, uh, that, we, that we're required to pay. Next question will go to Brian Flynn with All Nova Scotia. 
Hi, Premier. Uh, Mike already asked the question I was going to ask. I just want to clarify one little uh, part of your answer, which I appreciate you, you, you went into some detail. Um, that, that was the position that's been explained to you by Ottawa, is that correct? It, it, it certainly sounded like you were explaining the federal policy. That's not what the province is looking for. That's, that's actually what, what the federal government is planning to do. So if, you, if you're an international traveler when you land, doesn't matter if you come in, you have to be, you, they were doing quarantining places at the uh, air, whatever airport that is, uh, and there's a test. Uh, Dr. Strang explained this yesterday. They'll do, a, they'll do a test when you land. It's about three days, I think, before you, the test will be made, and then you find out whether you're positive or negative. If you're positive, you have to stay there. Uh, if you're negative, then you can go on to your destination inside of Canada, wherever that is. In our case, those temporary foreign workers who would be coming here, if they have a negative test, they would be able to continue on and come to Nova Scotia and finish out their 14-day isolation here. Go ahead with your follow-up, Brian. No, that's all. Thanks very much, Premier. You. Question will go to Jean Laroche with CBC. Good afternoon, Premier. I just want to follow up on a question Elizabeth asked about the uh, long-term care. Um, the news release that was issued specifically mentions veterans and their spouses, and there's a suggestion that this would also apply uh, to partners of veterans who res reside uh, in veterans' units, I guess, including Camp Hill. Um, is there a deal that what you have uh, uh, put in law in Nova Scotia will apply to veterans and their spouses? Uh, the... the uh, uh it would apply to any senior couple. Uh, if there are issues associated with uh, uh, somebody being uh, in, uh, one of them is a veteran and is already in care, uh, they would either, we would either be able to find them a space in one of our own facilities or quite frankly, we would, we, we would pay for the bed in, in, at the veterans wing uh, if there was a vacant bed for that spouse to be able to join their partner. Ultimately, this is to trying to keep uh, couples together uh, who are, are requiring care, uh, and oftentimes uh, they're separated based on the level of care they require, uh, and we just didn't think that was right, uh, and this piece of legislation uh, and the changes in the Act today will allow that to happen. Go ahead with your follow-up, Jean. But just to be clear, Premier, because uh, the Feds kind of run their own uh, institutions, uh, is there any sort of agreement from the federal, uh, from Veterans Affairs, that they will allow you to actually do that? We're doing some of that now. Uh, that's not that's not something that we we've we've. Uh, you may have noticed there are times when we've had veterans uh, who didn't didn't the federal government didn't necessarily fall under the what they deemed as a as a the terminology of the veteran. Uh, we found them long-term care beds uh, in there. I know. Uh, in some of our uh, veterans' uh, facilities around the province, when there's vacant beds and there's an overflow, we, we buy that bed. Uh, and in this case, uh, we will keep a couple together. Uh, uh, there was a case uh, that a, f a couple here, uh, were, one of them was in, in, uh, uh, at Camp Hill, uh, the other one required long-term care at Northwood, and the veteran moved into Northwood to be together. Uh, we would now have the ability to, get, uh, to work with the national government to have access to either one of those uh, facilities. Next question will go to Jennifer Henderson with the Halifax Examiner. Hi, good afternoon, Premier McNeil. Um, I, this, uh, my question is about a, a bit of unfinished business, something that, that you've been part of the whole time you've been in government, and that's the situation with respect to Northern Pulp. And I'd just like to to hear you um, tell us what you think the best case scenario would be for Nova Scotians. It seems right now, Northern Pump is still talking about perhaps uh, reopening the mill by seeking yet another environmental assessment process. At the same time, we know that by, um, uh, by, uh, uh, by breaking the lease uh, 10 years earlier by closing Boat Harbor, um, they're in a position uh, where they've been threatening um, to sue the province for tens of millions of dollars. So what do you think the best outcome would be for Nova Scotians with respect to this situation? 
uh, to have Boat Harbor closed and cleaned up, and we're on our way to do that. What the company decides to do will be a decision they make. Uh, I'm not going to speculate on that, but I can tell you what I think the best thing is for Nova Scotia is that the Boat Harbor is closed and that we're in the process of starting the cleanup. Go ahead with your follow-up, Jennifer. Um, and what would you describe as the most um, difficult lesson you learned while in public life, Premier? <laughs> Um, the most difficult lesson that I've learned in public life um, um, I don't know you know what I'll have to take some time to reflect on that I can tell you there's been lots of uh, surprising events over a period of time uh, I always say this everybody talks about wanting change and they all and they all encourage you to make change until it actually impacts them uh, and then all of a sudden it's not such a good idea uh, uh, but uh, that's the reality I always say this, change is happening every day in all of our lives. And we, have, we really have two choices. We either shape the change or the change, shape, the change will shape us. And I believe that holds true for, for a government and a province. The change is happening all the time. We can ignore it and let it shape our future, or we can try to shape our future together. Uh, and uh, that's what I have attempted to do uh, in the seven years of being Premier. I never wanted to leave this job. And if somebody said I was paralyzed by the opportunity, I was in an active government, we were an, an activist government. And I wanted people to feel like I uh, stayed true to who I was, uh, you know, uh, good or bad. Uh, people can pass judgment on me, uh, but I stay true to my parents. Uh, and I'm really, really proud of that. Uh, this is a tough, tough environment. Minister McClellan laid it out in his speech. Uh, on everybody around you, uh, but I am really proud of the fact that I stayed true to who I was and I stayed true to their values. Next question will go to Carla Rennick with Global. Hi, Premier. So it's been 10 months since this province uh, was the site of the country's worst mass shooting. What have you changed since then? You mean in relationship to, uh, what, do you, what do you mean, in relationship to the, uh, to the, to the, Shooting, you mean? I'm not sure of the question. Yes, yeah, in relation to uh, communication with RCMP, their communication with the public, um, the Justice Department in general, what changes has the province seen in the last 10 months so obviously um, the, as a result of the shooting? Well, obviously the inquiry is ongoing. Uh, that will go through that process, uh, analyzing everything that happened that day. Certainly uh, the alert system that we, that uh, EMO is dealing with, uh, uh, they're working with the RCMP uh, to ensure that that line of communication communication uh, functions. Uh, I think uh, I'd heard somewhere that uh, when we did that uh, alert uh, in uh, back in April, it was the first time the RCMP had used that form of a, a way to communicate to, uh, to Canadians, to the population. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they fully understand the process uh, and working with them and uh, uh, Minister Porter has been doing that. Go ahead with your follow-up. Go ahead with your follow-up. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure, you know, we all hope that nothing like this ever happens again, but in the case that it should, what do you think will actually be different this time? You know, for example, New Brunswick uh, made the change to allow RCMP to send its own alerts. Are you, are there any concrete changes that you uh, think will be different next time? Uh, there's a, there, that is ongoing right now. Uh, the inquiry, I'm, I'm sure, is going to bring us uh, uh, you know, recommendations, uh, things that will have to change. Uh, it, it is certainly, uh, you know, I, I think it's important, uh, quite frankly, that, uh, and this is just me, uh, that a, a single point of clearance for uh, of alerts happen. You know, one of the largest police forces we have in the province is here in Halifax. Uh, so, uh, it's important that all uh, agencies uh, have, have a single a port of contact. The issue that it showed up with our alert system really was, and, and one of the things that we needed to have our agencies to do is to be able to give us a clear message on what to communicate. Uh, and, and that will be ongoing, but I, Minister Porter is working with that. Uh, and I'm sure that if the police agencies across the province feel that they can do the job better, uh, separately from one another, uh, build more silos around uh, the way they communicate, uh, then I'm sure he'll listen to it. And that's all the questions we have for the before Premier we, today. Before we go, I, I do want to, this is my last uh, official cabinet uh, uh, here. 
um, I, I, I will be here through the transition. I do want to express my appreciation to everyone uh, who has uh, uh, held me to account uh, over the last uh, seven years. I want to express my appreciation to all of my colleagues who have stood the test, uh, quite frankly, uh, and, and I want to thank to my staff, current and former staff who have been uh, through thick and thin. I said this many times, some of them I've seen start their own families, some of them I've watched them lose loved ones and they've been with me when I've lost uh, loved ones. Uh, we have been in this tense environment together and I couldn't be prouder uh, to stand with them uh, as colleagues. I want to acknowledge my current Chief of Staff who has uh, came home to work for 18 months and now is five years later uh, still with uh, working on behalf of our government. Uh, uh, when I told her it was time for her to serve, I don't think she thought it would be anywhere near uh, five years later, but I'm grateful uh, that she stayed and helped us usher through some of the things that we've been doing over the last, uh, you know, five years, really. And I, I, I also uh, want to acknowledge and thank all of those who have sat on Treasuring Policy Board, who have allowed these tough decisions to be made uh, and who found our way through this. Uh, I know Minister Casey gave the province an update uh, on the fiscal health this year, which was about 800 million, a little over 800 million back in December. We will turn over a, a budget, uh, more like a status quo budget, but it will be far less. It'll be closer to 500 million uh, in a deficit position, uh, and then the new premier, new government can make some decisions. Uh, but I am, I am proud of the fiscal health of this province, and for all of those out there who believe uh, all I cared about was balancing budgets. You couldn't be further from the truth. I wanted to balance the budget so I could invest in your kids in pre-primary. I wanted to invest in children with autism. I wanted to make sure that the entrepreneur who had an idea knew they could create that job here in Nova Scotia. I wanted to be able to invest and graduate the opportunities to make sure that young people who come here to go to school or our own sons and daughters who get educated here saw a future for themselves in this province. I am grateful uh, for that. And, and I'm also really proud of the fact the face of this province looks very different than it did when I became Premier in 2013. There are more new Nova Scotians, our population has never been higher, we've never been more diverse. And I'm really proud of the fact that my daughter can see herself in boardrooms more than she could have in 2013. Our daughters actually are getting an equal voice around the government table, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of what we did on the bench, and I want to make sure uh, that uh, if, they've, if, if my daughter has an idea, uh, that venture capital is available for her, same as it would be for my son. Uh, so I'm really proud uh, of the record that we had, but we were only able to do it because of the men and women who got elected, who joined our journey, who worked for us, uh, and the support that we've received from Nova Scotians. They may not always like your decisions, communicate to them, but they'll respect them if they think you're doing it for them and not, and not just your government. Uh, and I want to assure all Nova Scotians over the last seven years, our government made decisions solely based on what we thought was in your best interest, not in the best interest of our government. Thank you all very much.